So you think we're ready? So yeah, thanks for coming by. I just wanna let everyone know, if you need to run out and go to another panel, no pressure, you know, you're not gonna, I'm not gonna feel disrespected or anything. So if you have to run out, I'm all good with it because I know there's so much pressure to get to everything at one time. Um, so yeah, my name's Timmy Vatt. Thanks for dropping by. Um, uh, I've experienced, you know, I can design, I can paint, I can model, and I can do rough layout at Pixar. Um, I know Maya, so I'm just kind of showing some stuff that I've uh, kind of gone through the years and um, stuff that I've learned from my peers. Um, so yeah, I, back in 2008, I started at uh, Pixar. I was um, working on Toy Story 3, and this is all the stuff I worked on over the years. I, I, I went to the Academy for five years, and then Activision, I got to work with my friend Tim Lamb. He's an art director at DreamWorks now. And uh, I'm really thankful that I had that experience because I really, we got to, I got to learn a lot from him. And then I bounced around at two other companies for another year and then I just, at Sanzaro, I really trying to hone in a portfolio to show for Pixar and then I, I got in by, I think by just having a friend that was at Pixar, he kind of catered my work and said, hey, this is what they're looking for. This is the language of what they're trying to see. And just that combination of me meeting Randy Barrett helped me get my, my job, I think. And yeah, this is all the stuff. I got to do characters on Battlesaurs and got to do production design on Kitbull and I production design on Light, Lightyear. Um, so yeah, this is just some of the work. This, is, I, this stuff is so old. Um, so yeah, like stuff I did for Coco. Um, I'm a big Paul Felix fan, so I try to do the Paul Felix style. Um, yeah, working on the good dinosaur. Um, and this was the, the stuff I did on Lightyear. Um, I just wanna encourage everyone. I, I, I got a call from friends saying, hey, you should apply for Lightyear. And um, I was, you know, I never production designed a, a feature and I, I would hear whispers in the studio like, oh, could, could you actually do it? And I wanna encourage everyone that I feel like that's what's really cool about being an artist is Everyone has your unique voice. You have a great, like everyone has this individuality and that's what movies need, you know? If, if a director picks you to be a production designer, they like your work. So I wanna encourage everyone that that's a good thing in the future, like if, or you can start today and create something that could be produced in the future and be a proof of concept. So it's never too late to start working on something that could be pitched to a studio or pitched to a director. Um, the thing that I kind of do to, to get Lightyear was I already had pieces of artwork. I started working on artwork to show Angus. Most of the time when people go into an interview, they don't bring any artwork. But I brought like eight pieces of artwork and said, you know, Angus, this is what you can do for Lightyear. This is how Lightyear can look. And um, so I have a lot of proactive type of uh, initiative. You know, no one asks me. I just, I just go above and beyond. And, you know, that's, that's an encouragement to all you. If you ever want to apply for anything or a, a movie, if you get your style to what you need it to be for that fe feature, just go ahead and start making art for it and then show your proof of concept of how it could look in the, in the film. And you know, if anyone needs to ask a question while I'm going through this stuff, you know, feel free to raise your hand and I'll, I'll um, a uh, answer something. Um, so this is all old sketches that I did in um, art school. I was lucky to have St uh, Steve Pilcher, Bill Cohn, and the late uh, Ralph Eggleston. And you know, I got to work with all the production designers at Pixar. And R Ralph is the, the, the father of, you know, at Pixar, because he was the first production designer. And you know, it grew to many production designers. And he was, a, he was a nerd for films. And he gave Bill Cohn this book called By Design. And it's a it's production designer book and they interview all these, all these um, production designers. And it's, you, you would find out that this book is um, like DNA connection to this uh, production designer from um, Gone with the Wind. Um, if you, if we can, I can put my email down or whatever if you need a slide of this so you can look. But if you wanna get into production design, it's never too late. I think, you know, you can start today to start production and designing. So uh, I'm gonna get into metaphors right now, and that's what a production designer does, is um, try to find connections through, you know, object, metaphor, symbol, to uh, color. 
And all this can be arranged in different ways. There's no rules to it. And that's what I want to mention is there is no rules to this job that you can do it the way you want once you have that option or even as an art director. Production designer, you get to oversee the whole feature. You get to talk to the modeling department, shading department. You get to be part of layout. And, you know, metaphors wise, like symbols, when I would watch, um, you know, Wizard of Oz and I would see the, you know, the yellow brick road or even the tornado, I'd be like, what's, what does that all mean? Or, you know, Vader having that triangle or, you know, the empire being so long and it goes on forever. Or something that's like a home, like something, like these shapes can look violent or they can look like peaceful. Or this could look, you know, like tempting or it can be, yeah, that's a, that's a good memory. All these things like, okay, eviction notice, but look at how shitty that box is, but inside the box is money. You know, it's like you can play with those type of themes in a film. Um, I'm trying to remember through uh, um, Jerome Ram uh, Ralph McQuarrie that did all the, most of the designs with Joe Johnson for Star Wars. He got an assignment from George Lucas. Hey, George Lucas told him, I need spooky skeletons as soldiers and that was the theme to the to the um the stormtrooper and uh, like what a what a perfect theme of the the grim reaper summoning the uh the the skeletons right like you don't you don't you don't feel but you feel it right you feel that kind of connection when you see the film i couldn't help watching old movies that i love like poultry guys and all the 80s movie like I remember seeing this movie where, um, you know, the psychic saying, you know, you're going to have to go in to get Carol Ann. And the, the, the husband comes out and ties a rope around her, and they hug each other. And um, before she goes through this doorway to another dimension, she tells her husband, don't let go. You know, it's like a symbolism of marriage and having, like, the hard times going through that. She goes through this dimension, and she comes out, and I couldn't help seeing, like, it's like a birth, right? Like... You literally see this physical, it looks bloody, but it's like, that's, that's what happens when you have a child, you know? This is exactly like a, like a you're feeling, it's, it's all natural to us. I, I felt that once, once, that moment right there, I felt that when my kids were born, right? And then I couldn't help looking at other movies, like, oh, Terminator, when he comes into the, the ground, you know, he, it would be funny if he was just standing or, you know, in, um, in uh, with, with Sandra Bullock, um, Gravity, thank you. You know, these images uh, kind of convey something. And I'm going to go through a few slides of movies. So Apocalypse Now with uh, Cop uh, Francis Ford Coppola. I couldn't help notice these soldiers, are, their humanity is gone. And they breathe fire. And I couldn't help notice these, you know, these are lizard-like creatures. They don't have any soul to them anymore. And I, I couldn't, like, I felt like there were dragons. There were there kimono dragons going through the landscape, killing everything. And you have these planes going through like a, like a, like, like Lord of the Rings or um, Game of Thrones. And, you know, you, you see the helicopters going over the landscape. It's like, pe like pests, pestilence and stuff coming, like, from biblical times. Like, I felt that when I saw these, like the napalm and all that. So napalm in the morning, right? Elliot, you know, it's cool, you know, follow me. You have that red jacket, right? But I couldn't help notice at the end when E.T. says goodbye to Elliot. Imagine him without a red jacket, how that light coming from E.T. makes Elliot look like he has a heart equal to E.T., right? Like these are all just really broad strokes and that's what I want you all to think about. I can do a rendered image, I can do a rendered painting but I want you to kind of think broad and holistically, and that's what a production designer does, is they think, zoom out. They zoom out, and, but they can also zoom in. <coughs> There's this, it's not a really good movie, it's, the, it's called Perfume, but a production design is really good in this movie. This, he's a serial killer, but he has this ability to smell, and every time you see him smell something, the colors are rich. And I thought that was simple themes in the uh, story that kind of, convey his ability to smell things. But if you see the movie, it has a great like, m medieval time production design to it. It looks dirty, it looks grimy. Symbolism wise, you know, uh, Contact, the movie with Jodie Foster, she has this bond when she's a kid, you know, 
trying to reach to other um, radio systems, and she has this bond with her father. She's a, she turns into a scientist. Her father passes away in the movie. She has this goal to almost subconsciously try to reach her father's soul. Like, it's not said in that. There's this, she gets this frequency saying, uh, like, from an alien civil, they don't know what it's from, but it's saying to build something. She's a scientist, but there's something spiritual that she wants to connect with her father. This symbol is the atomic swirl. It's a, it's a symbol of atheism. And I couldn't help notice that that's a symbol of atheism, and look at the design for the machine. The, the thematic discussion is driving the look of the, the, the design, and I think that's really cool, like finding these things and mixing them up. In color, I talked to Bill Cohn, you know, um, master colorist. He said red could look like the most happiest moment. Green could look like the most happiest moment. It could be scary. It depends on how you structure your film in the moment that you add those elements. This is the uh, shots from Shawshank Redemption. I'll just grab a movie and start screen grabbing. And every time Andy Dufresne, every time the warden's in a shot, you can tell that it's super dark. Every time he has a moment with his friends, it's, it's, it's bliss. You have color. And where do you, where, like, I would talk to Dice, and, you know, having a symphony, when do you use the loudest noise and when do you use a, the, the quiet noise? And I, I thought, you know, you can take a film and go into these moments. Another thing I noticed in Shawshank, Andy Dufresne is taking his friends. He built a library for them. You know, they're, they're, met, they're people that have gone through crazy stuff. And he gives them a library. And when the, I'm sorry, I'm going fast on this. The warden goes to his cell and starts knocking things over because they, they think he's hiding something because he wants to connect to him to start doing taxes for the, the, the guards. In the movie, Andy has a distraction on the window. He, has, he likes to go to the, 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 the field and correct, get rocks and then sculpt the rocks to make chess pieces. That's what a production designer does. They show something that's happening thematically through the movie. That's what Andy Dufresne is doing to his friends. He's making them people that can be helpful in society. Like he's, he's giving them a, like a, a library, getting people exposed to education. They become movable pieces to the chest. That's, what, that's exactly what's happening in the movie. He is, you, he's learning about people's abilities and then how, having it help his life because it's, he's been wrong in his life. Um, sorry if I'm going fast. You can let me know if I'm going too fast. Um, yeah, Oliver Twist, you know, same th theme of color. This is just black and white, but when do we see the most whitest white is at the end when they're free. They get to live in a house. I'm just, uh, if you ever want to start kind of practicing, you don't have a story, you know, you could take a novel, you know, I was, you know, the different seasons from Stephen King, that's where Shawshank and the body stand by me is from, this book. And then uh, I love Enemy Mine from the 80s, and I was like, what, is that, what does that movie look like in, wh from a book? And this was the cover when it was first published. If you ever get a chance, check out Enemy Mine. It's a little outdated, but I can see Hollywood totally remake that movie because it's so vital to this t these times. And I wanted to point to Lord, Lord of the Flies with um, William Golding. I can identify with the story, so I was like, okay, I want to do like an exercise with Lord of the Flies. Um, so I'm going to go through some of these uh, ideas of how I got here. This is just really quick. I, I did this in a day when I was working on Lightyear. I was like, I need to do an exercise of a movie. So when I'm on Lightyear, I have that, ex that exercise that I did. And I would show Bill Cohn, and Bill Cohn would give me great advice. Um, every movie you do, you go, do you go to the story. You do research, you implement research into your designer with the themes that you come up with, you can implement that. Present ideas to the director and then color shading and then you put it into the final film. This is like production wise. I'm not gonna go through all these but I'm gonna go through the first part. So the island, as a production designer, the island is a character as itself. You have all these main characters. I don't, the, if anyone knows Lord of the Flies, it's a small, it's a story where it's, you know, it's, it, these kids get crashed on an island. They're all 15 to uh, six years old. 
and they're waiting for someone to uh, rescue them on this desert island. William Golding's main story was that we create the havoc on our planet. Like this is a small, ca like little microscopic look at what we do on our planet. And I thought, I thought that was a cool, simple story, but it has so many layers to it. As a kid, I was always, like my mom, dad went in the back shed and I was the kid always building weapons and they told me to stop doing it. <laughs> so I, uh, luckily I found art, you know, to get all that uh, out of my system. And uh, so I would read the book, I would listen to the audio. What's cool about William Golding audio, he actually reads the book. So in, when I hear him actually say the book, I can actually hear him see his like emotional connection to the story and I thought that was really cool. I grabbed both movies. There's some uh, beautiful shots in the 60s uh, version, and I went to the 80s. So I have like all these resources. You know, of course I would grab every jungle movie I could get my hand on, and I'd watch all the movies I can. Of course, you got to go on vacation, right? And go to Hawaii, go to Zanzibar, <laughs> and do some research, right? That's what you that like. When I find out that a movie's not going to Italy or something, I'm like, I don't even want to be on it, you know? Not, <laughs> not, not for me, not for me. Gotta have the research because when you go out there and you actually smell the feeling of it, you get to take pictures, those pictures can support your paintings later. I learned that from Bill Cohn. When you go out to a location, you can always use those pictures to help you do your paintings. Yeah. Sorry, um, I'm wondering if you could uh, present this in the Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings? No, what is it? <laughs> oh. Oh yeah, no worries. No, they sound similar. You know, we would I would do like blitz, I would blitz it, you know, just I want to let everyone know it's all about just throwing idea like color down, adjusting it. It's all up it, it's okay to be wrong and I'm going to show you how to get there. So it's I'm you're looking at someone that fails more than I succeed. I I fail all the time and I'm failing like but I I love the experimentation of it. That's what I I don't see it as failure. I see it as evolution like evolving your ideas. Of course, I would do studies from Apocalypse Now, you know, just doing movie studies. It, it, you learned a lot. I, I learned a ton on it. So that's, that's where we're going to get to. So I just sat and started doing quick sketches, just rough ideas. Just I would read through the book, and then I would just try to, like, what does Jack look like when he's looking at the ground or when they're trying to hunt? This was a main shot that I wanted to do was in the book, William Golding says, they hunted at early dawn in the morning. I felt like I really wanted to represent this moment as early dawn, and I put that as a stake in the ground, that this is going to be early mor morning in that moment. And, you know, the pig running. So this is stuff I can read, like Jack's hi or Ralphie's hiding, and then Jack and his friends are trying to find. This is when Jack has just killed the pig and smears the blood over his face. Jack just made the kill of the pig, you know, just trying to make moments just really rough. Yeah, just, just really rough. I, I, can, I notice what they are. So this is Jack jumping on a log and then the, the, the pig's running away. It's really gestural, but I'm just trying to get ideas, simple shapes. And then I do some marker studies, looking at reference, doing marker studies. And then doing some more marker studies. And it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to just try these ideas out. I had an idea that Ralphie is the, the center of it all, and I was like, what about this heart idea, this heart pumping idea? So these are just rough. Let's see, uh, more rough sketches. I had this idea that the heartbeat was like a rhythm, and I would actually find rhythm like that in the, in the island. So let me go through these really quick. And then, yeah, the pig, pig's head, what does that look like? And then if using my connection of my w what I lived through you know like I would be like totally like yeah Jack let's start building stuff you know like so I could, could totally relate to that um let me see oh did it stop oh sorry so I hung out with Bill Cohen and he said this this is a really cool trick right I know there's not all adjectives he said take a page and just write adjectives and I said, okay, this side is the side when it's pristine, it's paradise when they get to the island. You know, the uh, rhythm of AIDS, the flow, you know, you have what just arbitrarily picking colors that I felt that m meant beauty to me. When Jack gets a hold, you know, sharp, you know, sore, like, you know, you have organization with ants, and then later on it's, uh, you know, just chaos with the flies, you know, 
you have that beautiful rhythm of the, the island, and then suddenly when Jack comes up, you know, there's holes in the leaves, you know, a frequency, and then flat line at the end of the movie. The sun is a power source that creates fire for them, and if it's used right, it can help them get saved, but they, of course they use it uh, wrong. <clears throat> and then this was a really quick trick that I learned from um, Sharon Callahan was, you know, usually in a movie you have storyboards, and I, I just created my own storyboards for the movie that I was visually trying to make up. And you line up all your storyboards, and then you can do stakes in the ground of like, okay, these, these photos all represent paradise. And you start using these images as later on you will color pick. But look at like timeline-wise how important this, this map can be from the beginning to the end. And you have your whole, whole movie on one page. So if you ever want to kind of mess around with that, I felt like this was such an amazing tool. Good Dinosaur, they went through writing changes. They didn't have, a, they didn't have the look of the film. Harley Jessup, Sharon Callahan sat in a room, color, colorized the whole movie in a few days with just photos. And that, like, just your photo picking could be uh, powerful. Just the photos you pick can be very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. So this is all references. It could be movies. It can be anything that inspires you, paintings or something that can. But you can later on use those as eye dropping, like your your palettes. You know, this is like you're trying to give a range of where this this stuff takes place in the timeline of the film, and then it could all be moved. It could all be, all be changed. And then that rhythm I was talking about, and then I started finding references that kind of represent. Uh, what I was thinking, it was it, it, you find those kind of connections that happen. And then, you know, the rhythm of leaves. You know, I was just messing around with all these ideas of like, oh, it, this is just rough. This is all big stroke, broad strokes. Um, and then I started, you know, I just blew these up big, you know, Jack hiding behind the leaves, you know, part of the, or maybe he becomes animal, he became, become animal vision. You know, maybe the colors are more hyper real or hyper like exotic, I don't know. So these are just really rough sketches. These are broad strokes. And then, yeah, like I would go in and try to do more finished paintings later on. So this is not, I mean, this is just me taking a crack at it oh, a few days ago. Um, so yeah. So then this is the character of the island. I want to go through just the local color. So say Ralphie, all them, they're going to change throughout the movie. This is just the change of the island. So say like you have the pristine island. Maybe the island has different types of colors and then it's chaos at the end because it's fire. And then I, so let's take the local color of the plants. And I was like, okay, plants are pristine, beautiful. And then maybe, you know, the sun, maybe they cut down the trees. The sun starts to expose on the plants vegetation more and they get um, yellower. And then you go further out and maybe portion of the island has more redder plants because I've been to Kauai, they have lush areas and then they have areas of dry because of the wind pushes and I would not have gotten that without even going, I mean, it's, that's why it's good to do research is that you start to understand exactly what you're designing. And then I started getting to like, if meat is a subject in the story, what if this is representing meat, you know, like the colors of meat. And then later on when it gets exposed to the air, it starts to go brown. And at the end, when the soldier comes and sees the kids all savage, that's my ending. It's gonna be brown and all the colors are gone. Two different contrasts. And then I would do dip. This is just really rough. How are the different states of those plants? What do they do throughout the film? And then, you know, you have the height. You got to have the height of your characters. And know when you're filming your shots, you're going to be close to those kids. All these plants, these heights of these plants are going to be really important. These are going to be important, but you want to make sure the detail low from here is enough detail because you're going to be close to those objects. So that's, that's something you kind of know when you start doing these sets. And then this is really rough, but say they, their first portion, they don't even look like kids. They're just, don't even think of a finished painting. This is just more ideas. This is broad strokes. Later on, you can give this to your shader artists. You can give it to your, but say like they first get to the island, green, lush plants, they start painting themselves. What would that look like? What would it look like if the vegetation is a different color? And what would it look like when, you know, the, the purples at the end of the film? And then what happens when you have fire? When you have fire, you know, that red will even go become even redder because that's, you know, in plays and stage plays, they actually do that is they 
enhance the color by having a local color onto a surface. And then, yeah, you have that progression, and that's kind of like, just for me studying film, I, I kind of got to that. How are we on time? 30 more minutes? Okay, cool. So yeah, that's, we kind of, I, I, I walked you through my process. That's, and you can do that pretty quick, right? You gather movies and all that. I felt like when you see Ralphie and uh, Peggy, wouldn't it be interesting you film away from the island and it makes it look like they're on, in a desert. What if you pull the, light, the if you pull the camera down and you get the shimmer of the heat, it'll look like they're on a, on, on a desert instead of an island. So. I thought those were cool kind of things you could mess around with. Another thing you could do, like I, I, how to bring in symbols with, with historical, you know, the octopus, a motif of evil and the, his, the historical propaganda maps, you know, they would use this in World War II. You know, Walt Disney did a thing where the eagle fights the axis of power in World War II. And, you know, the symbol of inhumanity. And um, so I... If, if World War II is a symbol of Lord of the Flies, I was like, wouldn't it be interesting when Jack is on one of these huge trees and Ralphie and Peggy come up and this tree, I don't think it's there yet, but this is just a stake in the ground and I wouldn't be scared to show this to a director, is what if Jack's main tree kind of resembles uh, an octopus upside down? Like you could see the tentacles. Like you're kind of bringing two things that are not existed and you put those together and you get a certain taste of design. And I learned that really close with Tim Lamb. Like, he's an amazing artist. Tim Lamb, we're drawing Medusa, and he drew this Medusa with like, like the snakes going over the face and the eyes. And I said, what, how, how did he think of that? He's like, I thought of a witch, not Medusa. I made a witch, not Medusa. And I thought those two ideas are similar, but one is posed differently. And I felt like that kind of re really influenced that design. When you, oh yeah. It's like a, it's like a rabbit hole. Like, okay, Lord of the Flies symbol of World War II. What was the symbols of World War II? The axis of power. What was the symbol of axis of power? octopus what was like you kind of go, keep going through the historical like what are some connections of that and that kind of it just for some reason starts to connect things I don't know how it happens like the color of meat to the color of those plants that are a little bit more deader I don't I don't know it's like stuff just starts to happen like that it's very strange um let me see oh yeah just more of that stuff and then I do a little paint try to clean them up you know and then you know get inspired by Illustrators that really inspire you, like Al Parker, and they're like, oh, yeah, that would be cool. Do you like them? They just crash, and they're swimming to the island. Um, and then linear motif, how's your lines? How's the, the rhythm? You know, uh, they, they use this in storyboards of, like, what is your position? Like, how are your framing? Like, if you want to learn about this, watch David Fincher. He's an amazing uh, linear motif artist just to study his frames. And then where's the fire happening? you know, like moments of the fire, and then that would be the final for that. So I can keep adding to that. It's just rough. So on the light here, I use all that as an ex just like exercise. I see a hand back here. Oh, uh, say again. David Fincher, yeah. F-I-N-C-H-E-R, I think, Fincher. No, 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 no. This was me trying to just experiment and learn. And when I was on Lightyear, I've, I've, I've never been like a feature production designer. I was like, I need something to figure out right now that's not Lightyear because I have so many problems on Lightyear. I got to figure this. And that gave me confidence. Once I had that, that exercise, I came into Lightyear and I was like, I'm ready. I'm re I, can, I know how to do this because I got Bill Cohn. Like if you're mentoring with a mentor, they give you these keys and they give you this confidence. You know, find a good mentor. Find a good mentor because they're going to open doors for you and give you confidence. I see a hand. How long did that entire Lord of the Flies exercise take you? So the painting I did for that, I did it within a day. But, but 
years ago, I was just sketching Lord of the Flies for fun. So I already had my shots sketched and I just grabbed them and just started doing those references. So I don't want to scare you and say, I did this. Over. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is more of me getting off of production and me getting to mess around with stuff and me experimenting and learning about production design and learning. So I'm a student. I'm a student and I'm just, I'm, I want to keep learning. And these are just little, little exercises. And I keep like, like doing little reps, you know, just, just little things here and there. Light year, I had to get done in three years. So all this right here, you're going to see that I was, I was, I was sitting down all day, um, gaining weight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because you you don't have storyboards for your novel. You want to read a novel and just start just sketching shots really roughly and almost like everyone. When, when you're on the phone talking to your mom and you're like sketching, those and those, those become the best sketches you ever do. That's how you draw those shots. They're not meant to be perfect. They're just beat boards. You're just, you're just feeling the shot and that's all feeling. They're not drafting. They're just moments. Cool. Um, but I'm curious, I've heard that in production design, that's kind of sometimes the title that you just need when you really influence the look and feel of a movie. It's like, yeah, of course you're the production designer, but as a, like an entry level position, what kind of things are you looking for? I think, uh, well, you're going to have to, uh, I think when you get into the field, you, you know, work as an artist, become an art director, but you can still work on your production designer proof of concept like you can work on those underneath your your day job and really flex those muscles so i'm not you should start today and have fun saying okay if i was making this movie because you know what happens you have these beautiful pieces of artwork and you show a producer one day and they're like that that's like what uh, tim burton did he just sketched out some bat they they had a warner brothers meeting they're like producer said we're gonna have a batman series he went home he sketched out all these batmans he went to the producer and she looked at it and she's like, yes, that's our Batman. We're done. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I have a question. So when you're working on the production design, do you have time to fight with Tim Burton? I try to make it like easily recognizable, but have you before you're trying to make it feel in two worlds? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, if you want to really go into the rabbit hole, go watch some Kubrick films. He will, he will direct, that's why directors just, They'll get into the rabbit hole of Kubrick and Kubrick just leads them all the way into the hole of like, what does this mean? <laughs> it's like, and he's like, he's messing with people. He's putting things upside down. So things could be, I think when a metaphor or a symbol is over the head, it's a little tasteless, but if it's hidden in there and it feels like, whoa, I, there's something about this design. It has something about it. You know, I feel it. Um, there's a hand back there. Finished stuff. So you're saying how how much time I do for designing and stuff? Yeah, yeah. So on on uh, the pandemic, I was able to sit and listen to meetings while I worked. So I try to put energy into work. And I I and when they say, Hey Tim, what do you think? I'd be like, Yeah, it sounds good. <laughs> so light here. So production design. We had this theme on the shots. We wanted things cohesive, clear, and cinematic. You know, old eighty stuff. This is how, like, Lord of the Flies stuff, I was like, the only thing I could really feel is like, okay, the egg lands on a, on a planet. And then you have the, the triangle like that, simple, just, you know. And then how does that progress over time? And Garrett Taylor, my art director, made this design. I, I said, yes, that is so effing cool. Um, let's see, it's changed, does it change? Uh-oh, it's lagging. Do I have a lag? Do I push it? Uh-oh. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> Let's see, left, below, down. We have a lag. No. Uh oh. Oh, did it, okay. So, I told Garrett, we need two hallways like the the plants. 
we need before and after. And Garrett went off and did a before and after of those two ideas. And this, like just this simple statement helps clarify where we're going. So always do a before or after, or what's the progression of the story and what does it need? And then I, I Garrett and uh, Greg Peltz, my other art directors, we have two art directors. I said, go and let's make Lego pieces and we can reassemble and use anything over again. The cool thing about how they created these, like Greg would model these in the end and they would look awesome. And if you spray these purple, they look like Zerg sh shapes. So we were trying to make more bang for our buck. And when you get to be a production designer, what you want to do is try to be economical, try to bring the budget down, try to bring things smaller because you don't want to blow your budget and then you don't have time to finish the film. Um, think work smarter, not harder. Um, so I would do paintings, moment paintings, just, yeah, I didn't know if it was going to be in the movie. And then you find out Pixar can't do rain. They don't, they're scared of rain because it's just too expensive. You're like, that's a bummer. And then, you know, the moment where he sees the, this, the place being built, you know, we, we looked at uh, launch sites. I got to go to NASA. We, we all got to go to NASA. I got to hang out with astronauts, them talking about what is it like to actually wear this stuff and go into space, um, doing your research where we go through. I also said, um, you know, light here should work in black and white. So if you take all the color out, hopefully the movie works in black and white. That was our goal. Pixar comes from a history of programmers, okay? I think Disney has this amazing style. The Disney has this great grasp of uh, like years of design. And Pixar, this is new concept to them of beat boards, beat boards for 2D animation. You have a, a, a studio that's just focused on technical achievement. And we're slow, I feel like Pixar, they're learning. You know, they're, we're, we are getting into like, Red came out, all these amazing like stylized. I think we're at a place where we're breaking through so much stylistic choices um, that I think the future is going to be cool, you know, and then I made, you know, illustrative notes and, you know, in production, all these artists will come onto the film, lighters, shaders, and they'll say, what does it look like, Tim? And you're like, these are my shots. This is what it looks like. And they start to go, okay, I get to, I get to see what this movie is going to look like and what are we going for? So I'm, I'm just encouraging, if you get on a movie early, just crank out ideas, crank out ideas and throw darts against the, against the wall and it's okay to not be right. Just like what we call it, throwing up. Just throw up all your ideas, throw up all your ideas and hopefully something will stick. And then, you know, th this was the final pass of all of our paintings we did. Garrett, me, you know, we all, it's, it takes a team. It takes a, a whole team to kind of create all this artwork. And then, uh, you know, you get to the director knocking on the door. Hey, Tim, what's a pass of the keys of the film? And I, I learned this from Steve Pilcher, you know, just take boards and start colorizing the boards with simple colors. So I just did some quick, you know, it, it, there's no, it, I just try to put it in a, a transition of what the movie could be, but it didn't stick like that. On an iPad, I just did the simple, this, this means like jargon, but I, uh, this, I showed, uh, Bill Cohen and I showed uh, Ian McGibbons, the lighting DP. He's like, this is what I'm thinking for the film. And I was like, yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. And that simple line bar helped, like in Lord of Flies, beginning to the end. And these are all the boards. I could colorize these, but there's so many. But I start putting references in, in, in moments that could possibly inspire those moments. The same thing as in um, Lord of the Flies. And then also too, this was tricky. What is buzz where at what time and what type of temperature that is in the shot? So how do you organize that? With this, it's a simple, it's a simple one board, but it helps you organize and, it, and you can show this to anyone in the studio and they know exactly what direction it is for light year. I did really quick passes of the, the, the keys. This is just blobs of color. You know, you don't have a, a shot. You just take the storyboard, take the storyboard and just do a wash of color, like literally, like some of this is just, like this is the storyboard, and I just put orange on it. And I was like, this shot is orange, boom. This shot is blue. Just, you'll get into the, it's called, I call them um, professional practices to speed up your time. And then, you know, your, your producer and director is knocking on the door and say, hey, Tim, um, do you have any ideas for this? And you say, this is not finished. This is more as a, a tool to discuss on what direction we could go. And then this was during the movie, I would do the keys and then I would just check 
the bar and check the shots of how they were transitioning in the movie. Um, we're almost done. And then I did this for the book. They were called knocking on the door publishing. Hey, we need something for the book. I was like, okay, uh, here, this is my final thing. And then I did this for the final movie. And this is at the studio. And um, I just want to let you know, I'm, I fail a lot of times, and, but I'm persistent. And um, so I, I want to let everyone know it's okay to just experiment, be a scientist, uh, pull things apart, learn about it, and put them back together. And um, that's pretty much it. Was that too fast?